The Bible says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, makes his paths straight. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem, and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. And John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of a skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts and wild honey. And preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latch of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but ye shall be baptized, uh, but ye shall baptize you, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And let's pray. Father, thank you for the reading of the Word of God. Lord, what an amazing book it is. We thank you so much that it is inspired and it is preserved. It is uh, accurate and true, trustworthy, Lord. And as we look at it this morning, we just pray that you take the uh, message that has been prepared, that you would uh, speak to the hearts of your people, Lord, that they would be profited from being uh, in church today. As the word of God goes forth, Lord, we ask your Holy Spirit to bless the preaching of it. Lord, I need your strength, your energy, your, your wisdom as I preach. Lord, help me to have my heart and mind plans. And may be filled with the Spirit to say what you want me to say. And uh, I just pray that you help me now. Help your people as they listen. We thank you so much for this. In Christ and we pray. Amen. All right. I think I'm going to need a volunteer. Uh, Jaden, why don't you come up here for a minute? Jane, yeah, that's perfect, Jane. Sit right there, Jane. Don't move. <laughs> First of all, let me say John the Baptist. Wow, what a character, huh? A uh, man that had a, whose diet consists of eating locusts and wild honey, a man who lived out in the wilderness. And um, a man that was uh, a hard-nosed type uh, individual, I and mean, he was a hard preacher. And as he's preparing the way here for, of course, Jesus Christ the Messiah, the forerunner, as John is known, he's preparing the way for Jesus Christ. Uh, many people were coming to him to get baptized. And I want you just to look at the phrase and John's testimony about himself in verse 7. And he preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me. Uh, there will come one mightier than I after me, that latch of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and um, loose. I was going to use my son for this illustration, but he uh, was a little bit intimidated, so this might not work as well on Jaden. But for my son, probably up until the age of four, maybe, I would say. Uh, you know, after coming in from outside, or and whenever we would leave, and this would be the case as well, uh, coming in from outside before he's ready to go to bed at night, Daddy, can you take my shoes off? Not so much now because he's older. And so, you know, it would be nothing for me as a dad to take his foot <laughs> off like this and to untie his. Your shoes are not even tied. Tied. I'm going to tie your shoes right here. There, your shoes are tied. So it would be nothing for me to come to my son and untie his shoe like this and then take it off. <laughs> um, like that, you know, that, that, would, that would be nothing for me as a parent to do that. And that would be a simple, simple gesture. And not only that, but I'm sure you can imagine, sometimes feet don't, uh, the, our feet don't smell the best. But during these days, they didn't have nice shoes like this. During John the Baptist days, they were much more like sandals. And uh, they didn't even have socks back then, at least that, where, that I've read. I'm not 100% uh, sure of that, but from what I read, that they were just bare feet with sandals. And so he didn't have, I'm not going to take your sock off. Don't worry about that. But, you know, for someone to untie someone's shoe was not just a common gesture. It was not something that was 
oh, 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 do I get to untie Jesus' shoe? You know, is that like one of the, the highlights of your, of, your, of your day, being able to untie Jesus' shoes? But John the Baptist made the statement here. You can put your shoe back on. And just that little statement. And I'll let you sit down, okay? That was no big deal, right? Well, John the Baptist makes a statement here. He says, I'm not worthy to untie his shoes. I'm not worthy to untie his shoes. That's what I'm preaching on this morning. Not worthy to untie his shoes. Really? It's, I mean, the job isn't really glamorous, folks. Many of you parents have spent many days taking your shoe, kids' shoes off, tying them and untying them and taking them off. I even remember there's been times, I don't remember if it was because I went to the dentist and was so much in pain where, I, where I'd come home and I'd just been in so much pain or if I had a really bad headache where I would just go lay down in the bed and then I would ask my sweetheart or wife and she's willing to do it. Uh, and I, yes, I've actually done this. I've asked her if she could take off my shoes just because I, I either being in pain or having such a bad headache. And she was willing to do it. I mean, some of you would think that's strange or, or, uh, that, that I would make her do that. But I asked politely and she was willing to do it. But, you know, is that anything special, really? But here, John the Baptist says, untying Jesus' shoes is a big deal. So much that I'm not even worthy to do it. I'm not worthy to kneel down and unloose the shoes of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine my wife coming in and, and saying, take your shoes off? No, get someone else for that. I'm, not, I'm bigger than that, you know? And although she I could have other reasons not to take the shoes off, she didn't. <laughs> but she didn't use that reason at all. Well, that's too big of a job for me. I'm, I'm a... Uh, first class wife, and I don't take people's shoes off. I'll have my uh, husband's shoes off. But no, she did it. She was a servant, and she took my shoes off for me. But just the thought that John the Baptist would use a simple illustration listen, I'm not worthy to untie his shoes. I'm not worthy to untie his shoes. What was John saying with that? Now, you've got to remember this John the Baptist was a great. John the Baptist was a great servant of God. John the Baptist was known by, uh, by others because of the testimony of Jesus Christ as the great prophet. Jesus, uh, born among women, there is not a greater than John the Baptist. So even Jesus Christ said, John is great. He's the greatest, uh, born among women. He's the greatest prophet. And yet, John the Baptist says, I may be great. And Jesus may even tell me that I'm great, but I'm still not worthy to untie his just that thought that John was so humble, so much of a uh, servant, and he held Jesus Christ up so high that he says, I can't even undo your, sh your, your sh shoes, Jesus. I'm not even worthy to, after a long day of seeing you perform miracles, seeing you give sight to the blind, seeing you heal the lame, and, and, and bring him back uh, he, uh, hearing to the deaf, even after you've done all the work of preaching and traveling and ministering to people, at the end of the day, Jesus, I'm not even still I'm not worthy to untie the shoes. Even though you've done all the work, I'm not even not worthy to take your shoes off at the end of the day. John the Baptist had a humble spirit. He said, I'm not worthy to untie his shoes. And this was repeated throughout the Bible. I'm not going to make you turn to the verses. You can if you want to. But in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, this word is slightly different. It says this, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So John makes uh, in Matthew's account of it these words whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. That word bear means to lift. So he was not saying, I'm not worthy to untie or undo, loosen his sandals. I'm not even worthy enough to slip them off, to lift them off his feet. That's how great and majestic and marvelous, that's how divine and supernatural, that's how holy and righteous this man is. I'm not even worthy to take off his shoes. 
And then in Luke chapter 3, verse 16, it's repeated again. John answers, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And then in John chapter 1, verse 27, He it is who coming after me is preferred, preferred before me, whose shoes latchet I am not worthy to unloose. So the testimony of John the Baptist was, there's coming one mightier than me, and I'm not even worthy to bend down on my knees to unloosen those sandals and to touch the dirty feet of the Savior. After a long day's travel on the dusty roads, feet would get very, very dirty. And John the Baptist says, I'm not even worthy to do a job that's so dirty. I'm below that. That is below a servant. You know, that is something that he was showing himself humble, but more importantly, showing Jesus Christ so great that I couldn't even think about losing his shoes. So I want to talk to you this morning about not worthy to untie his shoes. Why are we not worthy to untie his shoes? First of all, because he alone is worthy because he is the creator. If you look at Revelation chapter 4, verse 11 in your Bibles, I'll read it. You can follow along or you can just get to it later. We are not worthy to untie his shoes because he alone is worthy because he is the creator. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. We're not worthy to untie His shoes. Why? Because He's the Creator. I mean, He made us. He took nothing and made something. He didn't just take, you know, th uh, you know, things that were uh, not put together. He, there was nothing. But he just created something out of nothing. He didn't just, you know, uh, improvise and configure some different types of uh, an arm and a leg. He took nothing, made some dirt with nothing, and then eventually from that dirt made you and I. And he's a creator. He took nothing and just said, I want there to be an earth today. And spoke it, and there it was. He had nothing, and he says, I want there to be mountains. And he spoke it, and there were mountains. He took nothing. He said, I want there to be a sea. He spoke it, and there was a sea. He's the almighty creator. And that's why John the Baptist says, I'm not worthy to untie his shoes. Because in, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus, in the beginning, was with God, and by him all things are created. Jesus Christ is the creator. And John the Baptist said, I can't even untie the shoes of the one who created everything that there is. I'm not worthy to do that. I'm not worthy to untie the shoes of the Creator. Listen, you think about all that we see. You know, the creation, the, the, the trees, the, the um, nature, just the amazing things that we take for granted. It was all put here by God. God made it all and created it all and set it in the earth for our enjoyment and gave us the privilege of, of, of taking good care of it. At least we should be. Um, but the creation, God's a, the creator. And because he is the creator, John the Baptist says, I can't even unloose his shoes. I can't untie his shoes. Listen, Jesus Christ is the creator God. And he is high and lifted up. He, and he deserves all of our honor, all of the glory. And we don't have any right to even take off the shoes of the creator. He alone is worthy because He is the Creator. You think about that. You think about how God, in His marvelousness, was able to bring to life all that there is. And beyond that, He's a Creator in our own lives. You know, you think about in your life, God can make something out of your life. Your life may, may be to you, maybe nothing. Well, I'm not, I don't have this ability, I don't have this talent, I don't have this capability. I don't have this gift. 
and you think that God is limited, hey, if he can take nothing and make something, he certainly can take a surrendered human being who has a heart for God and use them for his glory and honor. And so God can bring something out of nothing. You may think in your life that there's nothing good. I feel alone. I feel discouraged. I feel depressed. I feel like I'm, I'm not fruitful. I just feel like I'm making no ground in my Christian life. You may feel like you're nothing, but God can take nothing and make something out of it. And God is a creator. He's that one that has the ability to bring to life that which never existed. And He alone is worthy because He is the creator. He's created all that there is, all the stars that are placed in the galaxies, all the planets, and they're, 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 they're always looking for new life on a new planet. And, you know, and they're just... People have studied uh, science and uh, astrologers have just made a life of studying science and yet they'll never catch a glimpse of the true glory of the one who created it all. I mean, you think of all that there is out there in the universe, it is truly amazing. The only reason it's amazing is because the person who made it is amazing. And he created everything that there is. And because he is the creator, he alone is worthy be praised and be honored. But next, Revelation 5, verse 9 says this. Not only is he alone worthy to receive praise because he is a creator, but he alone is worthy because he is the redeemer. Revelation 5, verse 9, and they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and has redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred, tongue, and people, and nation. John the Baptist says, I'm not worthy to untie his shoes. I'm not worthy to take, to take off the shoes of the Master. Why? Because he's the Creator and he's the Redeemer. He's the one that's going to shed his blood, sacrifice his life for my sins, for my wrong. He's the one that's giving up his life so that I can be saved. I'm not worthy to serve a God, to untie the shoes of a God who's so marvelous and so great. And neither you or not. I revel in the fact that God would call sinful man to preach a perfect book. Think about it. Sinful man, I'm not perfect, but yet he still calls sinful man to preach a holy book. Now, of course, he's given us the Holy Spirit so we can do it. But just the fact that he would even ask a sinful man to serve him. When he could ask his angels. When God could just speak. You, I mean, you think God has lost his power of just speaking things into his existence? But yet he allows us to serve him. He allows us to minister and to work in his, in his ministry, in his church. John the Baptist said, He alone is worthy because he is the Redeemer. Jesus Christ is the one who has lived a sinless life who has gone to an old rugged cross, who has shed His blood for you and I, who has been that ultimate sacrifice so that you and I could be forgiven of our sins. He is the Redeemer. And my Redeemer is faithful and true. And as my Redeemer sits there, I'm not worthy to go to Him and untie His shoes. He should be having an angel. He should be having uh, Michael or, or Gabriel do that. You know, he should be having someone that's higher ranking than, than me, a simple man. John the Baptist said, I'm not worthy to untie his shoes because he is a creator, because he is a redeemer. So I want to say to you this morning, as we think about not worthy to untie his shoes, a verse here in Acts chapter 13. Of course, this is a little bit familiar. This is John's testimony of his life. But I want you to notice the first part of this verse. In Acts chapter 13, if you look there, he alone is worthy because He is the Creator. He alone is worthy because He is the Redeemer. And our testimony should be, I'm not worthy to untie His shoes. Why? We are not worthy to untie His shoes. Two things here I want to think, I want you to show you from the Scriptures. I should have went back to the other one. All right. I'm going to make it to the Revelation again in just a moment. But Acts chapter 13, verse 25. And as John fulfilled his course, that's a key phrase there I want you to remember. And as John fulfilled his course, he said, Who think ye that I am? 
I am not he. But behold, there cometh one after me whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to lose. John fulfilled his course. In other words, John lived out the purpose that God for him. God had for him. John was in the will of God. He was doing what God had made him to do for. He was fulfilling God's call on his life and fulfilling God's purpose in his life. And in the will of God, John still could say, what am I? Who am I? Who am I? So what? I baptized thousands of people. Well, so what? Who am I? I, I I've encouraged people to turn their hearts towards, uh, towards the Redeemer, and towards the fathers, towards the mother, and the sons, towards the fathers. I've, I've turned people's hearts towards God. But who am I? I am not worthy of nothing. I am not worthy to even untie the shoes of Him. So I say this this morning. We are not worthy to serve Him. We are not worthy to serve Him. Friday night, we were not worthy to be in the same. Even though He gave us abilities, folks, you know, you weren't worthy to do that. I bet you ain't worthy to preach. I'm not even worthy to lead someone to the Lord. Now, should I be doing it? Yes, but I'm not worthy. I don't, I don't deserve the right. I, I haven't reached the point where God says, man, I mean, he, he's, he's reached the point in his Christian life where he's worthy to serve me. None of us are worthy. None of us are, are, are privileged or so much and responsible enough to be able to serve him. But yet, yeah, as you'll see in a moment, that's what we should be doing. We are not worthy to serve Him. I am not worthy to stand up and preach the Word of God. I am not worthy to lead a church. You, you, you are not worthy to sing in a choir, to teach a Sunday school class, to, to witness, to, to be a part of a ministry. You're not worthy for it. The day you think you're worthy, then there's a problem. We have to keep this humble attitude that, Lord, I'm not worthy. You could get anybody to do it, but you allowed me to do it. And I'm not worthy to serve you, Lord. I'm not worthy to serve you. Next, we're not worthy to open the book. Revelation chapter 5, verse 4. Revelation chapter 5, verse 4. I wept much because there was no man, or there was no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Now, I don't believe this is specifically talking about the Bible. I believe there's another seven sealed book that has not been revealed yet. Except to, except to John. But of course the Bible is in heaven. We know that from Scripture. And the Lamb's Book of Life is in heaven. There are some other books in heaven. But the worthy, Jesus Christ was the only one worthy to open up the books of heaven. He was the only one worthy to open up the Lamb's Book of Life, the, the, the seven sealed book. And every time I open up this Bible, try to remind myself that I'm not worthy to have that. There are so many countries that do not have the Bible. Am I better than them so God chose to give me a Bible? Of course not. Are we better because we're English speaking people than those that from some tribe out in Africa? No, none of us are worthy. But we have it. What a great privilege it is to be able to open up the Bible, to read it, to study it, to learn about God, to get to know Him, to have God speak to us through His Word. We're not worthy. And so we ought to treat this Bible with some more reverence. I yell at my kids when I see the Bible laying on the ground in the, in the car. Because I believe it's more... Hey, don't you dare step on the Bible. I know standing on the B-I-B-L-E and standing upon the Word of God, but not literally. And I'm, trying to, I'm not trying to make this an idol, but I'm just saying this is a holy book, and this deserves our reverence. This deserves our, our admiration. And don't get too used to having the Bible. People have died and shed their blood so we can have a copy of God's Word. And we're not worthy to open it. And you keep that mindset. Hey, God desires a humble spirit. 
And those that will humble themselves, God will exalt. And if you keep yourself with a humble spirit, I'm not worthy to serve you, God. I'm not worthy to preach this book. I'm not worthy to teach this book. I'm not worthy to go to a sinner and show them how they can know that they're going to go in heaven. I'm not worthy to do it. None of us are. We're not worthy to untie his shoes. We're not worthy to run this ministry, which is the Lord Jesus Christ's church. We're not worthy to untie his shoes. Now, listen very carefully. I hope you get that. And I hope you agree with that. And I hope you believe it. If not, then you better get along with God and, and make sure that you line up with John the Baptist's testimony that I'm not worried about God's shoes. That's first. You need to have that first. But just because we are not worthy does not mean we should have a careless attitude. Just because we are not worthy does not mean that we should be casual in our service for God. No. Because we're not worthy, we should be more diligent. Because we're not worthy, we should be more excited that we get to serve Him. Because we're not worthy, we should be more uh, uh, humbled and, and ecstatic that we get to serve a holy God. And that should cause us our best. That should cause us more preparation. That should cause us more uh, uh, di di diligence in, in our uh, work and our effort and our, our ministry. It should cause us to give 110%. Listen. People give 110% to, uh, to secular jobs. They give 110% to a hobby, to a sport, whatever happened to give 110% to the work of Almighty God. And we are not worthy to do so, but just because we're not worthy doesn't mean that we have the right to say, oh, well, it's only, it's only church. It's, it's, only, it's only vacation Bible school. It's only a choir ministry. It's only teaching Sunday school. It's only soul winning. It's only um, cleaning the church. It's only, you know, playing an instrument. It's only uh, going to a, a friend and, and inviting them to the church. It's only going to someone who's dis, uh, discouraged and down and showing them the love of Christ. Everything is a huge deal. And we are not worthy. But that does not mean we should have a, a careless attitude. Rather, it should, should cause us to be more diligent. A few verses with this. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Apostle Paul says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Apostle Paul says, listen, I beg of you as a prisoner, as someone who's in jail for the cause of Christ, I beg you folks to serve God and to walk worthy of the job that God has given you to do. We are not worthy to untie His shoes, but God is blessed us and give us the ability and the opportunity to serve Him. And so we ought to make the most of it. We ought to go into this service of God with the attitude that, listen, I'm not worthy to do it. And because I'm not worthy to do it, I'm going to give my all. We ought to walk worthy. As a pastor, I need to make sure I'm walking worthy of the job. As a Sunday school teacher, make sure you walk worthy of the job of teaching your kids. As a, as, a, as, a, as a musician, make sure you walk worthy of the job of, of, of singing in church. And that goes with living a clean life. That goes with, with, with preparing and praying and, 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 and doing it for the right reason. All of the reasons that you can use to walk worthy of it. As a witness for Jesus Christ, as someone that gives a, a track out, as someone that shares a testimony, make sure you're walking worthy of it. He goes on to say in Colossians chapter 1, verse 10, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Why should you walk worthy of the Lord? Please Him. We're not worthy to untie His shoes, but when we walk worthy of the job that God has given us, when we give 110, when we prepare, when we pray, when we ask and beg and plead for the power of God, and then when we give everything to the job that God has given us, that's even, you can ask my wife. I, I, sometimes I get picky with, uh, some, I, have my, I have my times, you know. Sometimes I, I slack when I'm thinking basketball. Most of the time I get picky with, you know, certain things. And, you know, I get, maybe even, I don't know what you call 
uh, obsessive, you know, getting, trying to get square inches of different areas when you're vacuuming and, and trying to have everything right in order, making sure the books on the bookshelf are, are, are nice and neat and none are falling over and, and then just different things. And sometimes I'll get really into just a, a mode where I'll, I'll, I'll be good for a few weeks and then I'll slide. But for the work of God, everything deserves to be first class, in order. That's why we're getting the church painted. That's why we need a new drawer. We need a new door. That's why I would love to get the parking lot paid, but even though we don't own it, <laughs> but uh, and there's other things around here that need to be done, and I and, and I want to get that I want to get done. Why? Because I want everything to be perfect. Now I'm not perfect, so I know I'm not going to be able to have everything perfect. But if I put the effort into it, and whatever you do for God, whether it's music, whether it's uh, uh, teaching, whether it's uh, serving, whether it's ministry, whether it's giving financially so the church can run. We forget about that as a service. Um, uh, that's a big deal. And do it with every ounce of energy. Listen, if anything deserves our time, our effort, it's the work of God. And so let's let's remember ourselves, remind ourselves that although we're not worthy, we should walk worthy of it. And we should walk worthy of it because it pleases God when He sees us fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. First Thessalonians 2, verse 12 says this, that you would walk worthy of God who has called you unto His kingdom and glory. Why should you serve God and do it with 110%? Not because you're worthy of it, but because called into his kingdom. Listen, you're serving the kingdom of light. The kingdom of darkness, Satan, wants everything in his power for the kingdom of light to be working at 50%. He doesn't want you involved. He doesn't want you dedicated. He doesn't want you diligently studying your Bible, working for God, working for the church. Satan hates that. But you've been called into his kingdom and for his glory should walk worthy of God. Now, is it an amazing thing? Here's John the Baptist saying, I'm not worthy to untie the shoes of Jesus Christ. That, that's too big of a job. I know I'm the greatest prophet. I know Jesus says I'm the greatest born among women. But I'm still not worthy as a great man of God to untie the shoes and to do a dirty servant's job. Isn't, that, isn't it amazing that years later, Jesus Christ would take a towel, take a bowl of water, take his disciples' feet, wash and clean feet of his disciples. He untied Peter's shoes, he untied Andrew, John, and so forth. He untied their shoes and he washed the feet his son, the son of God. He knelt down and says, this is what true servant does. He's willing to wash the feet, the dirty feet, a stinky 40, 30, 40, 50 year old man as they're traveling, sweaty, stinky, dirty feet. Jesus Christ was willing to do it. That's his true servant. Jesus Christ could have stood up and says, listen, you guys aren't even worthy to wash my feet, but wash my feet. No. Jesus Christ said, I'm going to show you a humble spirit. And if I'm not... He didn't say I'm too great to do this. I'm just going to show you. The greatest is someone who's willing to do the journey of God and wash his feet. Just amazing how Christ set the example for us. We are not worthy to untie His shoes, but... We have been called, we've been given opportunities, and given the privilege of doing just that. That's what this church is about. It's about tying up Jesus' shoes so we can run out of here and get people saved. It's about untying Jesus' shoes so we can wipe and clean them off so everybody sees how glorious and how majestic and how beautiful He really is. And that's what this church is all about. So this, the church, are just the feet and the hands of Jesus Christ. The church is the feet and hands of Jesus Christ so he can continue to do his ministry, do his work. We're not unworthy to tie his shoes, but boy, it's an honor to put his shoes.
He alone is worthy because He's the Creator and because He's Redeemer. One of the things that I tell myself often is this. If Jesus Christ could die in the cross, could be beaten, could have nails put through His hands and through His feet, could have a crown of thorns on His head, and could die for me and my sins, then can I certainly not live for Him? If you would die for me, can I not go to church? Could I not pray or read my Bible or try to encourage someone? The fact that Jesus did everything that was necessary for you and I to be saved deserves our gratefulness. You're here this morning and you don't know for sure that you are saved. Very simple. For all of sin comes short of the glory of God. The ways of sin is death. Thank God the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He's already paid your ticket to heaven. He's just waiting for you to come and get your ticket. And the way you come to Jesus Christ is, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You come to Jesus Christ by opening your heart up to Him and saying, Jesus, I'm coming to you. Be my Savior. Save me today. Forgive me of my sins. And like that, the Holy Spirit does not work save your soul from the destruction of sin. So if you've never done that, I pray that you will not leave here tonight, no, this morning, without doing that right there in your pew. I'll close with this. D.R. Larkin was a greatly blessed preacher, and from these comments you'll see he had a sense of humor. When someone asked me how old I was, I told him that I discovered America June 5th, 1901. Being born in June... I met with a very I was met with a very warm reception. I was placed on a milk diet and I was surprised when I first saw this country that I didn't speak for more than a year. You don't get it, do you? <laughs> okay, you don't think it's funny. I have a good friend in North Carolina who's almost 83 and he's still preaching. His brother is in his early 90s and he's also still preaching. My friend told me that once when he and his brother were preaching somewhere on a Sunday. Uh, the, um, the brother told the people how long he and his brother together had been in the gospel ministry. When he finished, a little boy asked him if he had been in the ark with Noah. When, when he told him he had not been in the ark, the little boy asked, well, how did you keep from drowning then? <laughs> um, so, you know, there's a testimony of some men that were 80 and 90 years old and still serving God faithfully. Why? I guarantee you why. Because they had the attitude that I'm not worthy to do what I'm doing. God's been good to me, so I'm going to keep on doing it. I'm going to keep serving it. We're not unworthy to tie. We're not worthy to tie untie his shoes. But give your all to walk as you are with Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the chance we have to.